one thing that we're doing today is we're wrapping up the series, Imago Dei. What does Imago Dei mean? It means the image of God. And so we've been studying from Genesis chapter 1 about what God did, what his plan was when he created us, when he created this world. So it's um, some important lessons that we've learned over the past few weeks. What have we learned? We've learned that you have great value. Something is as valuable as what someone is willing to pay for it. And the reason that we know that human life, that you have great value is because God paid the ultimate price for you. Jesus Christ came and he left heaven and became human and died on the cross for our sins. That's how much value each person has. That's why you've never locked eyes with another human being that God doesn't love. Now, does everyone love God? Is everyone serving God? Is everyone going to heaven? No. But the fact is God created people in his own image. And this is very, very important. We also learn that uh, you've got to learn to treat other people right because we're all made in the image of God. We learn from that that racism and prejudice are not only sin, they have no uh, they have no place in the life of a believer. We learn that you have been made by God to serve. And what we mean by this is that God made you to make a difference. God made you not to sit on the sidelines, spiritually speaking, but you get great fulfillment. You find great value when you're doing something for others. We say it this way, you serve God by serving others. I was watching our people out here uh, as they got set up for all this stuff. Just gives me, um, just I, I get filled with pride, like almost like a parent, you know. I see all the people in our church and how you serve and how faithful you are, and it just fills me with pride, the right kind of pride, not sinful pride. But uh, you serve God by serving others. Uh, we've learned that sex and gender are part of the image of God, and that matters. We talked about that a week or so ago. And then we learned that God has created us. Last week we learned that God created us to reign in life. Now what do we mean by that? You're to reign, you're to have dominion, you're to, you're to conquer, if you will, both spiritually and, and physically. Spiritually speaking, through your relationship with God and so forth, but also uh, physically speaking, that doesn't mean that you get to be the boss of everything or that you got to have your way all the time. But what it means is that God has created us to bring glory to him with our lives, with our work, with our family, with how we live, with our hobbies, with everything. Because First Corinthians tells us that uh, in whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. Well, in this passage today, as we look at this for the last time in this series we're going to really answer the question, why are you here? Now, I realize I, I've used that kind of language a lot, but it's very important to use this language and to learn it and to repeat it and to think about it. This is not a repeat message, but the theme is repeated throughout Scripture, and we've seen this a lot. Why are you here? That's a great question. If you read in Genesis, the, you realize that connected to this creation story was the story about how God told Adam and Eve, he said, you may eat of every tree in the garden except for one. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the day you do, you're going to die. And he gave mankind a choice and they rebelled and sinned. And then if you remember in the story, after Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit, what happened? It says their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked and they tried to cover up some fig leaves. You remember the story? And remember how it said that God would walk with them in the cool of the day in the garden? And God asks the question of Adam, Adam, where are you? Now, did God lose Adam? Did he not know where he was? No, we know that scripture teaches us that he knows all things. He has all knowledge. He sees all things. He didn't need to be informed of where Adam was, what God was doing was getting Adam to recognize where he was. And God asks us that same question. Where are you? Why are you here? 
What is your purpose? What are you doing? As a parent, if you have kids, you have asked that question a lot. What are you doing? And my mother, I love her. I saw her a couple weeks ago, went up to North Carolina. My dad had hip replacement surgery. He's doing well. Thank you for those of you that prayed for him. But I can remember my mom asking me when I was a kid, do you want a spanking? How many parents ever said that? How many of your parents said that to you? All right. How many of you realize that may be the dumbest question ever asked? Now, I was a smart aleck growing up. I know that's hard for you to believe. Um, but my mom one time was like, do you want a spanking? And I just said, yeah. And I really got it. But it was worth it because I got to be a smart aleck, right? But you ask that question to get someone's attention, to get them to think about what they're doing. We have three children uh, Brittany, Brandon, and Brooke, they're all adults. And um, when Brandon, our son, was probably about three years old, I had a mi- we had a minivan. And um, I worked at a church in Florida, and uh, I'd stop to run in and get something out of my office, and then we were going to go get ready for the Sunday morning ministry and service and all the stuff that we did. And uh, how many ever had one of those cars that had like a little change holder? You know what I'm talking about? You can put your coins in the little uh, thing next to the driver's seat. Well, I went in, wasn't in there two minutes, came out, and Brandon had grabbed every bit of the change that was in that little holder. And I asked the question, I think that God kind of is asking us here. I said, what are you doing? And without a beat, three years old, he looked at me, he kind of closed his eyes. He said, I got it for Jesus, Daddy. I got it for Jesus. Well, I believe God wants to remind us of his power, his love, his plan for us. But he wants us to recognize it. You see, it's one thing to know about God's plan, and it's another thing to live God's plan. And so let's read this passage one more time. Genesis 1 26 to 31, then God said, let us, first reference, I believe, to the Trinity. We know that God is one God, a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, interesting language, doesn't seem to be matching in singular, plural, does it? You know, all of our English teachers, you know what I'm talking about? But God was doing this on purpose. Let us make man in our image. And he said, we'll make him, but then he said, them. Why is that? Well, that word for him is about, uh, in the Hebrew language, it, it is talking about mankind. It is not just about males, but rather it is about mankind. So he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We learn that God has called us as male and female to complement each other in the church. And we both bring very important things. And it is important to celebrate who you are made to be in the image of God. Whether male or female. Whether man or woman. And the New Testament kind of completes this in Christ where the writers in the New Testament said uh, after having uh, such religious tradition throughout the world, it said that there is neither male nor female, bond or free, uh, Greek or barbarian, uh, or Jewish or barbarian. And, And he's talking about those that were not from the religious background that the Jewish people were from. What is he saying? He's saying that you are important to the church, that God has a plan for you, that you have something. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, that God wants to use you. And we bring this to the table. And then he said, God bless them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you Every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit and you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth 
everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. I love that. There's a finality to it. There's an authority to it. When God says something, it's so. I I used to hear this little phrase, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I completely disagree with that. God said it, that settles it. Doesn't matter if I agree with it or not. God said it was so. And when God says something is so, our responsibility is to respond to it and to do what he says. He said it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Well, I just want to give you three reasons why you're alive. Three reasons that we find from this passage that should inform the way we live. It should, um, it should help us to live by this path, this plan, this purpose. God has in our life three reasons, for, I believe from this text, that show us how we are to live. Three reasons you're alive. You're not alive just to fill some skin for a few years. You're not an accident. God didn't make a whoopsie when he made you. You're not just an accident out of billions and billions of people on this planet and throughout world history. God knew who you were. He planned for you before you were ever born. And he says, here's what I want you to know about me. You see, the word of God is not just a collection of stories But I believe that it is the inspired, God-breathed word from God. Did he use human authors to write it? Absolutely. The Bible talks about uh, it being inspired by God. That word means God-breathed. And God gives us his word so that it will show us how to live. It is through the word of God that we find our purpose, our meaning. We find out about Jesus Christ. We find out how to have a relationship with God. We find out what's wrong in our lives. We find out what we should do, what we should correct, what we should change. We find out who we are. You see, the word of the enemy will try to tell you that you are something that God never said that you were. He'll call you a loser. He'll say you're not enough. You're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not rich enough. And all of these things really don't matter at all because that's not who God says you are. When you are a follower of Jesus Christ, when you put your faith in him, what does the Bible say about you? It says you're a son or a daughter of God. It says we're a son or a daughter of the king. The Bible tells us that God's plan for us, and we talked about this a week or so ago, uh, is that we are kings and priests There is a spiritual nature and a physical nature to it. God said that we are more than conquerors through Christ. Now, don't get it all mixed up. That's not saying that you can do some things that you know you can't do. God says that uh, you can do all things through Christ. I've seen in Christian schools uh, where you'll have two Christian opposing football teams And they both claim that verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I've seen Christian athletes run through a banner and tear it and, you know, everybody yelling and cheering, God's on our side because we're Christians. And we're like, I guess we're going to find out which one of you God loves more tonight, aren't we, you know? Well, that doesn't mean that you don't have some physical limitations. Uh, I can do all things through Christ Uh, Yes, but I'm 59 years old now, and um, there's some things I can't do that I used to be able to do. You know what I mean? And I know that Toby Keith said that, you know, I may not be as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. That, too, is a lie at my age, okay? I can't even be as good once as I ever was, all right? So he's not talking about this. I I, I saw a game show one time, and um, a Christian guy was on there. And um, th- it was a contest, kind of a game of chance. And this guy was like, he could either take, it was like half a million dollars that he had won up to that point. He could either take that or he could try to answer another question. He's going to get a million dollars or whatever. And I'll never forget this guy. He's go, he goes, well, the Bible says if you can believe, you will receive. And so 
he lost all that money because he got the answer wrong. So when God says you can do all things through Christ, understand in the context, he's talking about, yes, the Holy Spirit empowers you. Yes, God will give you strength. But if you'll read it in the context, Paul, the apostle, he was saying, I have been through tough times and good times. I've been hungry and I've been full. I've had plenty and I've had lack. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And God is letting us know that what we can do is we can endure. We can, through the power and the strength of Christ, we can follow him. So being a follower of Jesus Christ, it informs you of who you are. You can reject the lies of the enemy. He is a liar. Jesus said he was a liar. He said that uh, he's not only a liar, but he's the father of lies. And then he said this, and this is incredible. He said that he came, talking about the enemy, that he came to kill and destroy, and, and, but Jesus came to give life. And so why are you alive? What do we learn from this text? Well, let me give you three thoughts and we're done. Number one, write down the word worship. You were made to worship God. The image of God means that people have the capacity to know God. If you were made in the image of God, you have the capacity to have a relationship with God. Charles Spurgeon, he was a famous English pastor from the 1800s. I want you to listen to a quote that he said one time. He said, man was made in the image of God and nothing will satisfy man but God in whose image he was made. You know, we know this to be true. You can find satisfaction to a limited degree in a lot of things. Winning a game, if you're an athlete, there's some satisfaction to that. I'm not saying there isn't, but it doesn't last. One day you're not going to be able to be as good an athlete as you were. One day those days will be over, and then what do you do? Um, you can find there is some satisfaction in having a good job and having the money to be able to pay your bills and not be stressed out and feed your kids. I'm not suggesting that there's anything spiritual about being broke. It's not. There's nothing spiritual about being rich either, okay? But the, the truth is, if that's where you get your satisfaction, you're going to have an empty spot in your life. You can even make a counterfeit God out of your children. Did you know that? Many people in our culture do that. They, they believe that what's lacking in their life, and, and, you know, often it's like, well, I can just get married, uh, then I'll be fulfilled. Marriage should be fulfilling, okay? But I remember Kim said to me, uh, you know, uh, several years ago, uh, she said to me, and it kind of offended me at first, she said, you do not fulfill me. And I'm like, What? And she says, no, no, I get my fulfillment from Jesus Christ. And see, when you learn that, then you can be fulfilled in marriage, truly. You're married to a sinful human being, an imperfect person. They're not going to be perfect. And I wish, I wish, I wish that it could feel like it did when you first fell in love all of the time. But the truth is, it probably won't, all right? There are going to be times you wake up in the morning and you go, ooh, you know, <laughs> what in the world happened overnight? It looked like you wrestled and lost, you know? Um, and there are going to be things that are said and done that will be offensive to you. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that I don't recommend marriage. I highly recommend it. Kim and I have been married for 37 years. I'm very, very thankful. I love her more now than I ever have. And she has demonstrated love to me uh, over the past few years of my life in ways that I didn't even really understand until I saw it in action and how she has taken care of me and all these things. And so uh, marriage is wonderful. But listen, you can make a counterfeit God out of marriage. You can make a counterfeit God out of a relationship. You can make a counterfeit God out of a kid. Often couples that don't understand that their fulfillment must come from God, here's what happens. If I could just find me a man, if I could just find me a woman, right? And you get married 
And then after a while, you're like, well, so much for that, you know. And then you're like, well, if I could just have me a kid, that would give me meaning and fulfillment. And I'm not suggesting that having kids is not wonderful. I'm not suggesting that you should not find uh, a fulfilling relationship with your kids or that, uh, that you would ever want to go back to not having kids once you have them. It's wonderful. Psalm 127 says that children are a gift from God. But listen, they can become a God in your life. We live in a culture like that now, do we not? Kids that rule the roost. I can remember a time when the parents actually were in charge. I don't know, some of you are there at my age, you remember that, you know. And somehow or another, we turned out okay. Um, and, and so, but my, my point is, don't, don't misunderstand. God wants you to worship him. Wonderful to have children. We have a wonderful children's ministry. Um, if you have kids, uh, birth through fifth grade, they need to be in our children's ministry. We have wonderful leaders and volunteers there that love them and pour into them. It's great. If you have middle and high schoolers, you need to get them involved on Wednesday nights. It is wonderful. We love these kids, and they're so awesome and very proud of them and so forth. But listen, if you're not careful, what happens is you'll begin to worship, without realizing it, the kids. They get the agenda. Um, they get first place. Or the grandkids. And my point is, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying, you will only find fulfillment in life the way God created you, which is to have a relationship with him. Don't make a counterfeit God out of your job, out of your kids, out of not having kids, or whatever it is. It's really easy to worship things that were never intended to be worshiped. So what do we learn from this text about worship. Well, God demonstrated his power by creating us. Jeremiah 32, 27, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. Nothing too hard for God. Luke 1, 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. We serve a God who is powerful, and we should be thankful for that. What else does uh, God show us? He demonstrates his love. I want you to understand that God did not create out of the need for anything. God didn't have an empty spot in his soul and think, you know, if I can create the universe and if I can make me some humans, that, that'll be awesome. That was never a part of the thought process of God. Why? Because God is perfect. He is complete. He has perfect fellowship within himself. That's why he's a singular being, all-powerful. He's the God of the universe, but he's, uh, he is uh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay? The beauty of the Trinity is absolutely mind-boggling. God had perfect fellowship with himself. There were no needs that he had to fulfill. So you know what it shows us? It shows us the mind-boggling, incredible love that God has. Because he created us, not just so he could love us, but I want you to get this. Until you discover this, you're never going to find true meaning in your Christian life. He created us so that we could love him. That's the blessing. That's the beauty. That is the incredible part of it. Not just that God loves us. That's amazing. But the fact that God made us so that we could love him. It's the greatest gift that God could ever give us. God demonstrates his love. Job 10, 12. By the way, understand the context of Job chapter 10. You remember the story of Job, richest man in the, in the region at the time, very powerful, very blessed, had 10 kids. And in one day, the story goes, in one day he lost all of his wealth, everything, and all 10 of his kids. In one day. I'd say that was a bad day. But I want you to hear what Job said. In the middle, and then he lost his health the next day or so. And so Job had lost everything that was important to him. Notice what he said, Job 10, 12. Talking to God. You have granted me life and favor. Hold on a minute. I was rich an hour ago and now I'm broke 
I had 10 wonderful kids an hour ago, and now they're all dead. I'm going to do all 10 of their funerals in the same day. Hold on, I was healthy as I could be just an hour ago, and now I am in such pain that I have to sit in a heap of ashes. What do you mean I have favor? What do you mean I am blessed? Well, understand something, that God's love for you and God's favor on your life does not depend on your circumstances. Do you know why that is? And I, I've had to learn this lesson. It's because we can see the immediate circumstances and what we think is that we know what will be better, right? Even though we don't know the future, we can't see what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the next 10 years holds. And, and, and often God says no to our prayers. He answers prayers. Sometimes he just says no, okay? He also sometimes just says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Be patient. I got something better for you. There have been many, many prayers that I've prayed that God said no to, and I was a little pouty about it, to be honest with you. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I didn't get that. And then later I found out, oh, that's why you didn't give. Thank you for not saying yes to that prayer. The point is that God sees all. We don't. We don't. Um, he said, you have granted me life and favor, and your care has preserved my spirit. Do you want to be able to survive the Job moments of life? Just believe that. God has granted you life. God has given you favor. He loves you. He has a plan for your life. And God loves me so much that he has preserved my spirit. You can make it through. That's what God's saying. You can make it by trusting him. Um, so what does that mean? God created us to have a relationship. God wants us to know him. God speaks. Now, God can speak in whatever way he wishes. I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I can tell you that I've heard the voice of God in my heart, in my mind, so much that it might as well have been audible, okay? But then there are times that I just hear God's voice through the word of God. There are times that I hear the voice of God just in the quiet moments and I'm praying. And then there are times, to be honest, that God speaks to me through other people. And he'll do the same for you. But understand this, God speaks. That should give you great, great comfort. I mean, think about it. Someone who does not love you, who does not know you, they're not going to speak to you. They don't care. They don't care about you. But someone that you love... Someone that you uh, care for, someone that you know, you're going to speak to them. God does that for us. God gives purpose and meaning, and God provides. In this text, we see God as the provider when he provided food for all the trees. God wanted us to know from the very beginning that, yes, we're going to work, and yes, we're going to have a job, and yes, we do need to be productive, but ultimately, he is the provider. And until we understand that, we're going to struggle in life. Well, we worship. I spent the majority of the time on that. Here's the last two points. Number two is work. God commands us to be fruitful and to multiply and subdue and have dominion. That shows God's purpose for everyday living. Here's what you need to understand. God wants you to invest your life, not waste your life. God wants you to invest your life, not waste your life. Now, what does that mean? Well, I believe that you've got to have the proper relationship with work. Work is important. It's a command from God. But it should not be all-consuming. It should not take up every moment of your life. Hey, thank God for your job. Thank God for your ability to pour into that. God made you to do that. But listen, God wants you to prioritize your worship over your work. Okay? Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your work to the Lord and then your plans will succeed. You see? That's why I say things like this. I realize the Sabbath day uh, for the Jewish people was Saturday. Uh, we have the Lord's Day on Sunday because Jesus resurrected on Sunday. And that's why the tradition changed. But understand this. G God gave us the principle of Sabbath before the law was ever given. At, after six days, on the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. 
He rested. By the way, God wasn't tired. He did this to show us. And by the way, the interesting thing is that during the days of creation, you know what God did? The, the Hebrew word, when he speaks, you know what it means? To breathe out. To breathe out. You know, when you're working hard, sometimes you breathe out. Sometimes you get out of breath because you're really out of shape and you breathe out really hard, right? But when you're working, you know, you're, what are you doing? You're breathing out. You're speaking out. Do you know what the word rest in Hebrew means when God rested on the seventh day? It means to, it means to catch your breath, to breathe in. Now, did God need the rest? No. He was showing us this principle that we not only physically need a regular day off to rest and to relax, but we need spiritually to worship God. And this is the reason that I say you can get more done in six days. I'm talking about over the long term. You can get more done in six days than you can in seven. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, it does. Because by committing the Sabbath, that principle of rest, that principle of worship, when you commit that to God, you know what you're doing? You're saying you're in control. I'm depending on you. I'm going to work, yes. But it's, I realize it doesn't all depend on me. And when you begin to do that, you will be more productive. Now, of course, Jesus gave the example that uh, if the ox falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, you'll get it out of the ditch. But just like I told you a couple weeks ago, uh, the pastor I grew up under uh, in North Carolina, he was a country guy. He said, yes, if the ox falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, you get it out. He said, but if the same ox falls in the same ditch every Sunday, either get rid of the ox or fill in the ditch. And the point is that we worship God not only through going to church and giving him time, but also through our work. You see, when I understand that it's not all about me, I've got to have that relationship with God. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let, let me kind of start wrapping this down. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I'm going to read from the message paraphrase. And I love how this reads because it helps us understand worship and particularly work as worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. By the way, that's the key. Committing to him. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Do you know how transformational that is if you'll do that? You're giving it to God. You, going to sleep, that can be an offering to God. Now, not going to sleep in church, all right, but going to sleep, you know. Maybe don't stay up till 4 a.m. playing video games, all right. But go to sleep, go get, go get in bed, all right. B bring that to God. You're sleeping, you're eating. You can eat to the glory of God. Now, I must admit, there are times that I probably eat that doesn't bring God glory because I ate too much, all right? So, but our eating, uh, sustaining life, going to work. You didn't realize you could worship God through your work, did you? But going to work. Hello. We live in the metro area of Atlanta. And part of the problem with living in this area is the traffic. Uh, driving to North Carolina a couple weeks ago to, with my dad with having surgery, a drive that normally takes five hours, it only took me nine and a half hours. Now, I had to work on my attitude, all right? I had to pray a lot. Because the things that I wanted to come out of my mouth were not prayers, all right? And, and you can take your going to work life and your walking around life when you get home, when you go on vacation, when you're going to do whatever you do, going to a ball game, going fishing, going shopping, whatever it is. God says, Place it before him as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Do you know what this culture says? 
You don't have time for church. You got some money to earn. You, you got some stuff to do. You're too busy to waste your time. Do it. By the way, you can watch a podcast. You can listen to Christian music in your car. I can read my Bible, and I talk to lots and lots of Christians that they may not verbalize it that way, but that's how they feel. And God says, don't be so well adjusted to your culture. You know what the culture says? You don't have time for that. You can't afford to do that. Um, you got more important things to do. You don't even really control your schedule anyway. Well, God says, don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you don't even think. Instead, fix your attention on God. And then he says this, and all of this, you'll be changed from the inside out. See, that's the kind of change that lasts. Not the kind of change that comes from the outside in. You just try to change the package. You try to change the look. Uh, nothing wrong with trying to improve your looks, okay? Certainly better than trying to ignore your looks, okay? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hating on that. If you uh, like to dye your hair, more power to you. I don't, my wife tries to get me to color my hair all the time. She really does. She's like, your gray hair makes you look old. I said, it's because I am old. What are you talking about? Um, nothing wrong with trying to look better. Nothing wrong with trying to exercise, eat right, stay in shape, all that kind of stuff. But understand what he's saying here. He said, real change comes from the inside out. Not the outside in, but the inside out. He says, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. You ever feel God telling you something, the Holy Spirit whispering something to you, and you just like, la, 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 I don't want to hear that. I'm ignoring it. Oh, man, I, I've done that a lot of times. And God says, the key to real worship with all of our life, quickly respond. Do it now. Don't wait. He says, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to live that kind of Christian life. Uh, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not people. You want to know the key? No matter where you are, if you're starting out in your career. We got a young man today. I found out uh, tomorrow he leaves to go and join the Marines. And uh, he is uh, Joshua back here in the back. Uh, we're so proud of him. He's grown up in this church. Went to our youth group. And uh, man, uh, it's just wonderful what he's doing. But here's what God says. Not only to you, but to everyone. Just work like you're working for God and not man. When you're in the Marines, you work for God. When you're a school teacher, you work for God. When you work at Delta, you work for God. When you own your own business, you work for God. No matter what it is that you do, treat it as if you're working for the Lord and not for people, and God says you will be blessed. Let me give you, the, I don't have time to deal with this last one much, but the third reason he made you was for witness. Consider the tremendous implication of what God's command to fill the earth was. It wasn't just to have kids, but it was rather to fill the earth with worshipers. And our job is to fill the earth with worshipers of God, and we've got to do it now. And you say, where do you get that from? I want you to notice the last verse that we read in that passage in Genesis 1. And it's almost a throwaway sentence, except for God doesn't throw any words away. And they're all there for a reason. Listen to what it says. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. You say, what does that mean? You know what I believe it means? That God understands. He is outside of time and space. He is outside in eternity, okay? But you and I, you know, we're constricted by time and space. The Bible tells us that he has numbered our days. The Bible tells us that our, uh, the breadth, the span of our life is about like the span of a hand. That was an old measuring unit of about the length of the tip of the thumb to the pointer finger. 
And you know what, you ever done that? Like kind of eye something and think, yeah, that's about right. It kind of gives the idea metaphorically of what God does with our life. Yeah, that's about right. He knows how long you're going to live. He knows how many breaths you're going to breathe. He knows the number of heartbeats you're going to have. And make no mistake about it, God wants us to understand that we have a limited amount of time. Now, we don't need to stress out about that because for the believer, when this life ends, eternity begins. That's when the good stuff starts to happen. It's going to be amazing, okay? But make no mistake about it, you've got about that much time. Isn't that amazing? The span of a hand. When God looks at your life, he says, yeah, you got about that much time. For others, it might be about that much time. For others, it might be that much. But the point is that God wants us to understand that we've got a job to do. Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. A wise person understands that there's a time clock. You know, I, I've seen athletes from winning football teams and they were coming back they were furious it was, you know but the game has four quarters and they're like man I, we were going to win that game we just ran out of time well they lost because there are rules and they ran out of time okay you've only got this much time and what God says to you and me is this don't put it off don't buy the lie that there's a better day oh, I'll do it later because I do believe that the devil gets so many Christians not to deny their faith, not to say they don't believe in God, not to say that they're not going to make a difference, that they're not going to serve. You know what he says to us? I'm going to do it, but not right now. I'll do it later. I'm planning on it. I'm getting around to it, but I'll just do it later. Well, God says, teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. So what do you do? Well, I think you worship regularly in church. That's important. Um, you work as if you're working for the Lord, and then you witness as a lifestyle. Now, this is the last thing I'm going to challenge you to do. Invite somebody to church. Everybody can do that. You say, well, you know, I don't have a seminary degree. Thank God, all right? I've got four of them. And the truth is, I don't know if I wasted my money on it or not, but I, mean, I did learn a lot of stuff, and I'm glad I did it. But, you know, you don't have to have a seminary degree to know the Bible or to learn about God. You know, I heard somebody say about somebody, they were asking them a question about, can you identify what a woman is? And the person said, well, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know. And then I heard someone respond to that and said, well, I'm not a vet, but I know what a dog is. And you know what? I may not be the smartest guy that's ever lived, um, and I may not be the greatest scholar that has ever lived. Here's what I know. I know there's a God, and I know that I can have a relationship with him. And so can you. So can you. You say, well, I don't know about all that. Well, you can. That's the good news. And so I want to encourage you to invite. You don't have to have a seminary degree to do it. You know what you got to have? A willing spirit. The courage to invite somebody. In fact, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, we're going to have a day when I'm going to get everybody in our church to do this. We're going to have a day soon, and I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet. I may just keep it real simple and say it's just lunch. But here's what I'm going to challenge everybody in our church to do. Invite somebody, maybe that doesn't normally go to church, somebody you work with, some of your neighbors, a family member, whoever, and tell them, hey, if you'll come to church with me on this Sunday... I'm going to take you out to lunch afterwards. And here's what I've learned. Everybody likes lunch. And you know what else they like? They like free lunch. And you say, well, I don't know. I, I can't take them to Ruth's Chris. Take them to McDonald's. I don't care where you take them, all right? Uh, take them to Applebee's, you know. Take them uh, or, or cook something at your house. Make some nice, delicious fried chicken or barbecue or whatever your specialty is, all right? But here's what I know. We can be a witness and invite somebody. Invite somebody. You may not have all the answers to life, 
but you don't have to. But you can love people and invite them. And so maybe today you can pick up an invite card and give it to somebody. Or maybe in the next week or so, we're going to get everybody to get some of these cards, all right? So, but tell somebody, tell somebody, you can invite them. Why am I here? Why did God create me? Why am I here to fill this skin for a few years? God wants me to worship him. He wants me to be serious about my work. And he wants me to be a witness for him. Amen. Do we receive that, church? Amen. That's the word of God. Father, help us today to worship you, to give our work to you, to be a witness for you. God, help us to do this with all of our heart. And we'll thank you for what you do in us and through us and for us. Of course, in Jesus' name I pray. Before we finish our prayer today, I wonder online or in the room, would you say, Pastor, I need to receive Jesus today. You can pray something like this. Understand that salvation does not come from your works. It does not come from joining the church. It does not come because you're a good person. It comes because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And when we place our faith in him, that is when we can be saved. So you say, well, I don't know what to do. Say something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life and forgive me and save me, lead my life. I commit myself to you. If you'll pray that simple prayer, God promise, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.